Dr. Chomsky, I, I want to, there are so many things that I want to talk to you about, uh, but at the same time, uh, because there are so many different issues, uh, we're not going to be going into uh, uh, deep into all these issues, so we have time to talk about and touch on a lot of these issues, and also we am expecting to have um, uh, a heavy uh, call in uh, uh, tonight. Uh, I want to start with a subject you probably had hundreds of interviews, if not thousands, which is 9-11. Most the people that I talk to or I interview on this uh, program, I normally ask them the question of what do you think about 9-11, what happened on 9-11. But I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to be direct and ask you who did 9-11 and why? Well, I think the best evidence we have is that it's uh, pretty much the story that was reported. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you, can you hear me? I'll repeat. Uh, you hear me? Did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. It's very low. So. Uh, um, All right. I'll try to speak louder. Okay. Is this better? Uh, but much better. Much better. Okay. I think the best evidence that we have is that uh, the story that was reported is basically correct. Uh, airlines. Uh, the uh, hi there were hijackers. Uh, their identities are more or less known. They hit the World Trade Center. Uh, one of them hit the Pentagon. One of them was one of the planes was uh, stopped and uh, 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 down in Pennsylvania. And, uh, there's no real evidence to suggest that that's wrong. So, are you saying that you are with the notion that uh, an airplane hit the Pentagon? Yeah, I think the evidence supports that. Okay, and uh, you are also with the same uh, notion that uh, the Twin Towers were destroyed due to uh, these two airplanes hitting them? As far as we know, there's no evidence to the contrary. No, no credible evidence to the contrary. I mean, if there were evidence, there's an easy way to determine uh, whether uh, there is persuasive evidence to the contrary. Uh, there are thousands of... Uh, highly qualified uh, civil and mechanical engineers and graduate schools of engineering all over the country, uh, uh, those who think there's physical evidence to the contrary can find plenty of people with uh, appropriate credentials to consult with, and uh, if they can be convinced, I'm sure they would have no problem in uh, publishing papers and uh, um, serious journals uh, putting forth the evidence before the scientific community. Well, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened, so it's impossible to proceed. Uh, what about the... Uh, now, one thing, why do you think the government is not coming out and showing us the videotapes from uh, the Pentagon. I mean, they put out a uh, one said, this is the evidence, but you really couldn't see anything. So why, why aren't they coming and saying, okay, this is exactly what happened, so stop all these conspiracy theories? Why are they not doing that? Well, I suspect that part of the reason is that they don't mind the conspiracy theories very much. In fact, they get quite uh, tolerant treatment. And it's, I can only speculate here, but I suspect that the reason may be that uh, they regard this as uh, helpful to them since it, uh, there's a huge uh, amount of energy and effort uh, being directed into uh, efforts to uh, determine, determine what's called 9-11 uh, truth uh, 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 initiatives and so on. And that huge amount of effort is diverted away, necessarily, uh, from uh, inquiry, protest, and action uh, concerning much worse crimes of the administration, far worse against Americans as well. So from their point of view, it may not be a bad thing. Uh, actually, I, I don't, I'm only speculating about their reasons. A, a way to determine their reasons would be to... Uh, uh, organize a congressional inquiry. There are congressmen who'd be interested to uh, investigate uh, what is being withheld and why. Uh, incidentally, it's perfectly standard for the government, any government, to 
to try to withhold information from its own population. Uh, anyone who's looked at the declassified record, as I have and others have, know that uh, uh, the only that most of most of what appears there is an effort to is, is not to protect national security; it's to protect the security of governments from their own populations, which they typically regard as a kind of an enemy. They don't want the population to know what they're doing. So withholding evidence is not unusual, but there are ways to proceed to uh, 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 bring it into the public. The easiest would be a congressional inquiry. Now, in, in light of what you just said, and if you uh, uh, realize that uh, uh, Bush yesterday in an interview or a couple of days ago, um, which is not, nothing new, they, they, they've said this before, he said that we... Uh, that Saddam had the capacity, uh, now the line is changing, that Saddam had the capacity to uh, manufacture weapons of mass destruction. And then when he is asked, uh, what does Iraq have to do with, uh, because he mentioned that we lost 3,000 people in the, in the Twin Towers, uh, one of the questions was, what does Iraq have to do with that? And he said nothing. So, Correct. You, you know. Correct. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay. So, so. Uh, is, is that part of the evidence that you're talking about, that if, if they show the evidence, then... No, no, not at all. Then there's I'm another everyone. question about why we went and killed uh, a couple of hundred thousand uh, Iraqis uh, and uh, 3,000 of us? Yeah, we knew the reason for that. In fact, uh, uh, there's the Iraqis know the reason for that. Uh, the most recent poll in Iraq is just a, a couple of weeks ago, I think by a U.S. Uh, investigating uh, uh, polling agency, found that uh, I think it was 75 percent of the Iraqis uh, take for granted that the United States invaded Iraq to gain control of its oil. I think that was pretty obvious from the beginning. Okay. It certainly has nothing to do with 9-11, and uh, we don't need any information from it. Okay. Now, we're going to get into, that. into the, the oil uh, uh, later on in the program, because I, I've read your uh, opinion about the war. But let me uh, switch gears a little bit now to Lebanon. Uh, recently, right before the war, you visited Beirut and you visited with uh, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the, uh, uh, the uh, Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah. And uh, you said, I think Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah, uh, has a reasoned and persuasive argument that the arms should be in the hands of Hezbollah as a deterrent to potential aggression, and there are plenty of background reasons for that. Do you uh, still uh, think that uh, Hezbollah should keep their weapons? Well, I didn't say they should keep their weapons. I said they have a reasoned argument for it. And in fact, uh, at the time that I said that, that happened to be the opinion of, according to polls in Beirut, of about 60% of the Lebanese population. By now, that has risen to about 87% of the Lebanese population uh, who accept now, the, uh, uh, as a result of what's happened, the Hezbollah argument that uh, this is the only possible deterrent to a, uh, an Israeli invasion. I mean, it would be very nice to find another reason. I mean, there are two questions here. One is whether Lebanon has a right to have a deterrent against a uh, an, uh, an Israeli invasion, and to be precise, we ought to say a U.S.-Israeli invasion. Uh, Ninety percent of Lebanese uh, regard the invasion that way, and they're correct, so let's uh, be accurate. So the first question is, does Lebanon have a right to a deterrent against the U.S.-Israeli invasion? And remember that this invasion in July is the fifth one in the past 30 years. Uh, none of them with credible pretext. So the first question is, does, do they or does anyone have a right to deter a U.S. Uh, or U.S.-Israeli invasion? Well, of course, in you know, elite circles in the United States and Israel, they'll say, no, nobody has a right to deter our efforts. But if we don't accept that, and of course the traditional victims don't accept it, then comes the next question, what should the deterrent be? Well, I, I, I did visit, visit uh, uh, Nasrallah, but I also visited many others, including his most uh, 
the strongest opponent. I spent more time with them, and I can, and many others. And I, continue, I was interested, so I asked them uh, what their opinion is, and nobody has an answer. In fact, there was a national dialogue uh, shortly after I left before the invasion, uh, which was concerned with this issue, and it reached no outcome. The uh, Prime Minister of Lebanon, who's uh, a Sunni, not a Shia, a Shiite, and is strongly opposed to Hezbollah, uh, nevertheless uh, expresses the position of his government, his his own position in his government, is before the invasion, that uh, Lebanon, that Hezbollah is not a militia, but a resistance organization, and therefore is not subject to uh, UN Resolution uh, 1559 or the new Resolution 1701. Well, that's their opinion. It's their country. They have a right to decide whether they need a deterrent to U.S.-Israeli invasion and what that deterrent ought to be. Okay. I'll tell you what. We have uh, some people waiting to talk to you, so let me go to the phones and we'll come back and uh, discuss other subjects. Uh, Tony on one. Go ahead, Tony. Yes, Dr. Chomsky. Can you hear me? Yes, he can. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Chomsky, I've read many of your books, um, and uh, they're, they're absolutely fascinating, but I have a general question, and I'd like you to address it. Uh, I read a, 19, a 2004 paper that Robert Bork had delivered to an international body on uh, human rights, and what disturbed me in the paper was the suggestion by Bork that... Um, individuals did not have um, universal fundamental rights, and he questioned whether or not uh, this, this uh, particular viewpoint was not the source of, of, of most of the troubles in the world. The question is this. It seems to me that by using this concept of terrorism, that most of the governments of the world are on a course of international authoritarianism that has as its objective to um, minimize and, if, and for all practical purposes, do away with dissent uh, with every government as Tony, a consequence of Tony, which go ahead, only go ahead rights that individuals will have <clears throat> will be government sorry. rights. Okay, ask the question, could you, Tony. Could you repeat well, that's, the, that's the question. Okay, very good. A doctor? I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear. I think the connection is not great. No, go ahead. Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, but I couldn't hear the question. Only a few words. Could you repeat it? Uh, he's he's off. Um, no, but could you tell me roughly what it was? Uh, tell you the truth, um, I was hoping that he will ask the question, but he was talking about, um, um, I don't know, Tony called back. Um, okay. I'll tell you what. Let's let's move to uh, uh, to uh, something else. Um, yeah. Now, do you think methods like uh, unions or joining together under uh, the system is useless today? And what I'm talking about is like uh, governments joining together under the uh, uh, one system. You know, perhaps uh, the only option left is to create your own independent and self-reliant system, like what Hezbollah has done, and uh, 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 you know, and they're, uh, and they're, uh, uh, to fight for their system and they succeeded where others have failed. Do you think that people should be looking for what is going to work for them? Uh, do you think we will see this more and more uh, in the world? Uh, you know, things like Hezbollah, we will see that people will take matters in their own hands instead of being on with the same system? Well, uh, I think we should... Uh, uh, there's a reason why organizations like Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and uh, uh, others have developed, and it's well understood. So one of the leading, uh, most respected journalists in the Middle East, Rami Khoury, is the editor of uh, the Lebanon Daily Star, uh, before the invasion, pointed out that uh, the Arab states have, uh, have failed. They are failed states. They have been unable to protect their own populations, to uh, deter uh, U.S.-Israeli invasion to prevent, prevent the U.S. and Israel from uh, taking over Palestinian lands and territories and moving towards driving Palestinians to oblivion. Uh, they've been unable to protect their own people's rights, to provide them with services and so on. And he said in that kind of situation, 
Uh, people are not going to just say, well, okay, you know, I'll decide to die. No, what they're going to do is form their own organizations. So you get structures uh, within the state uh, that provide services uh, for people, that uh, provide them with some protection, that provide some degree of deterrent against attack. Uh, and that's essentially what Hezbollah is. I mean, it developed as a result of the U.S.-backed Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which uh, killed maybe 15,000 to 20,000 people and destroyed much of the country. Uh, in response to that, a resistance developed. Hezbollah took over after finally the leadership of it, and it did succeed after uh, many years in uh, driving Israel out of Lebanon. Now, that's after 22 years of... Uh, Israeli violation of Security Council orders to withdraw, which they could do because they were backed by the United States. Uh, as well, I want a lot of prestige for uh, leading that resistance. It's now the, along with it, with Amal, which is very closely related to it, the similar program, uh, the two of them are essentially the uh, parliamentary representation of the, uh, the Shia uh, 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 sect uh, group in uh, the Lebanese confessional system. It's the largest of the minorities, and uh, Hezbollah and Amal represent it. They have similar programs. Uh, furthermore, Hezbollah was very successful in uh, health, education, uh, uh, other services to uh, the generally poor and neglected population, mostly the South, a few other places, uh, which the government uh, wasn't doing. And they won a lot of support for that. Uh, pretty much the same has been true in the case of uh, Hamas and uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Egypt and elsewhere. I mean, the, uh, the, I mean there's, there's a background to this. I mean, the U.S. and Israel have, uh, and the West in general, uh, strongly opposed uh, secular uh, Arab nationalist forces and just helped destroy them. And they were partly destroyed by their own corruption and so on. But uh, they were under severe attack from the West. The United States has strongly opposed secular nationalism. Uh, uh, and the U.S. Favor, has favored, traditionally favored, radical Islamism. I mean, the most extreme uh, radical Islamist state in, in the world is Saudi Arabia. And by comparison, Iran looks like a... You know, a democratic um, heaven, and that's the oldest and most valued uh, ally of the United States. Uh, Israel, uh, the Israeli U.S.-Israeli alliance uh, was really firmed up in 1967 when Israel performed a huge service to the U.S. government, to the uh, Saudi Arabian tyranny, to uh, uh, the energy corporations, uh, by destroying of the main force of secular Arab nationalism, uh, namely Nasser. Okay. Uh, it continues like this. Well, okay, what has happened is that uh, uh, radical Islamism has uh, filled the gap uh, that has been opened by the uh, destruction of secular movements which were unable to serve the population. So, yes, in those circumstances, you are going to find just what Rami Khoury described. Uh, organizations developing within the country that will provide the services that the government is not providing. Okay. Uh, doctor, stay with me. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back. Yeah. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. We are speaking with Dr. Noam Chomsky. Just one note uh, to our viewers on the uh, Internet. Uh, unfortunately, I am told that our Internet has uh, been attacked so a lot of you may not be able to see us. We are trying to work on it, but I'm told that it has been attacked. But we will have the show. Now, uh, uh, those of you who are watching us on uh, cable, uh, if you know anyone watching us on the Internet, just tell them the show is still going. Uh, we will have a, a, a rerun on, uh, on our, it's going to be on our website later on and also will be on Google's videos. So you will see this interview. Uh, again, I, I apologize you're not able to see it on the internet now, uh, but I'm, I'm told that we are, uh, uh, our uh, site has been attacked or our streaming has been attacked for some reason. I don't know. You're too dangerous, doctor. <laughs> well, not that dangerous. <laughs> 
Um, Dr. Chomsky, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, now, I have, I always, I read a lot of your articles, I mean, way back when I was in college, and uh, I was very impressed with the way you uh, critically uh, criticized Israel and the way you talked and wrote about the uh, Palestinians and their plight. And I know for a fact that you have built up a lot of credit behind your name that you have millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of followers. And my question to you is, uh, why don't you, uh, because of what you write, uh, why don't you take steps on the ground to help the Palestinians, such as maybe calling for a boycott of uh, Israel or sanctions against Israel or divestments from Israeli uh, corporations, uh, something substantial on the ground. And I know a lot of people are following you and they follow what you say and write. But why aren't you calling for substantial actions to actually force the Israelis to give the Palestinians a break? Well, I am calling for years, have been calling for substantial actions that, uh, in my, that are the most effective and important, in my view, much more important than that. And those are actions right here within the United States uh, to change the policies of the U.S. government. Uh, it's because of U.S. government policies that these things are happening. And we're responsible for what the U.S. government does. We don't live in a dictatorship. There are plenty of things wrong with the government, but it's a free country. Uh, we're, it's open. It's a, we have the options, uh, if we have the will, to change U.S. government policies so that it will permit uh, a resolution of the Israel-Arab conflict, Israel-Palestine conflict. And the form of that resolution has been pretty clear for 30 years at least. There's a very broad international consensus that the major step towards resolving the problem is to establish a, a two-state settlement on the international border, it's the pre-June 1967 border, with minor and mutual adjustments to straighten out the ceasefire lines and that sort of thing. Uh, well, they, that reached the international agenda in uh, 1976 in a resolution at the Security Council uh, proposed by the Arab states and supported by the Palestinians and most of the world, but the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, and I won't run through the rest of the record, but uh, that's pretty much the way it's been since then. In fact, right at this moment, uh, the U.S.-Israeli alliance is uh, dedicating considerable efforts to undermine the option permanently by carrying out programs of annexation, uh, dismemberment, uh, imprisonment, in fact, in fact, of little cantons in the West Bank and Gaza. That's our policy, our responsibility. I want to talk about sanctions and boycotts. They should be against the United States. Uh, we're the ones who are responsible for it. And that's, I think, the substantive proposal that should be made. It's, uh, we can't, you know, we can't uh, cast the blame on someone else. Uh, if Israel will certainly do this as long as the U.S. finances it, uh, provides the arms, supports it, uh, gives it diplomatic support, economic support, and so on. Okay. Now, let me, those let me, are choices that can be made right here. Okay, let me just uh, uh, stop here for a second. And I know you said we need to work on changing the system here in the United States, but that is not going to happen, not in my life, not in probably for another hundred years. And I know your stance on the uh, Israel lobby by uh, Mersheimer and, and, and uh, uh, Watt. Um, and also, I know what you have said about uh, Israel serves a strategic asset for the United States and that the Israeli lobby, primarily APAC, is little more than a pressure group like any other trying to affect United States policy. I never seen a lobby that controls so much in any country like the Israel lobby, and you called it uh, nothing more, uh, little more than a pressure group. Now, you know anything about Israel will be 98 senators voting for it and 450-some, uh, uh, 420-some 
uh, representatives. So changing the system from the inside, that is going to be hell to do if it's not impossible. And uh, so what other ways can we go besides changing the system from the inside? And wh what do you say about, I mean, when you, when you play down the effect of APAC in the politics of the United States and call it just a little more than a pressure group? Well, first of all, I didn't say that. I said it's the most, it is the most effective of the lobbies. But uh, the lobby is not APAC. The people who focus on APAC are ignoring the lobby. And I've repeatedly made uh, emphasized that. There is a lobby. Uh, the main lobby is the uh, uh, educated, the intellectual classes in the United States, the educated, articulate sectors in the United States, uh, the people who write, uh, who, who run, who publish in the media, who publish in journals, who write opinions, uh, who do most of the scholarship, who uh, staff the, uh, uh, the, the think tanks and so on. Yeah, that's a really important lobby, far more important than APEC. And they happen to uh, support uh, uh, U.S. Uh, policies towards uh, Israel and the Palestinians. And if we look back, at, I mean, APEC's a part of it, but it's a relatively small part. Uh, and that's important, but we can change that. We don't have to wait a hundred years. You don't have to wait a hundred. You, you, you don't have to reform the U.S. system in a dramatic way to have public opinion influence policy. Those are small changes. I mean, that's happened in the past. It happens in other countries. Now we can achieve it here. If we look back at the way in which this massive lobby was formed, influential lobby was formed, it goes back to what I was saying before. It didn't exist much. It was very minor before 1967. It became extremely important, significant after 1967. In fact, dominant in the uh, uh, articulate sectors. Well, what happened in 1967? Just what I described. In 1967, Israel performed a huge service for U.S. strategic and economic interests, economic centers and the strategic interests uh, for uh, the energy corporations, for the, uh, the military industry, for high-tech industry, for the um, tyrants who rule the uh, oil, uh, oil producers. Uh, 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 and that was a great service. They destroyed secular Arab nationalism, which was their main enemy. And, uh, 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 and in fact, at that point, uh, the uh, U.S. support for Israel solidified and the uh, articulate uh, lobby uh, took shape, and that's continued. So in, a couple of years later, in 1970, uh, uh, Jordan was actually slaughtering Palestinians, uh, Black September 1970, and it, briefly as though Syria might intervene to protect uh, Palestinians from, from being slaughtered. Well, the U.S. didn't want that. Uh, and uh, uh, what they they were afraid that uh, Syrian intervention might be a threat to the oil producers who were very close allies of the United States, of course. Uh, well, the United States at that point was in no position to make any uh, military or other move to deter Syria. It was bogged down in Indochina. Uh, but Syria, but the, you know, Israel did it for us. Uh, they mobilized their air forces as powerful military, thanks to U.S. support, and. Uh, yeah, they mobilized their forces and they uh, threatened Syria. Syria backed off. The slaughter went on. Uh, that was uh, very much welcomed by U.S. power. In fact, U.S. aid to Israel uh, quadrupled that year. Uh, and if you look back at that time, you find that uh, the uh, opinions of, of uh, U.S. intelligence, of analysts and others, were exactly that uh, Israel can serve as a strategic um, uh, ally of the United States uh, to uh, strategic asset to help uh, the major U.S. programs, which are concerned with controlling the energy uh, uh, system. Okay. In and fact, the Nixon administration at that time described uh, Israel as one of what they called the local cops on the beat. Okay. Uh, there were several states okay. that were Chomsky. regional okay. cops. Doctor, uh, if, if you don't mind, around. just for sake of time and people waiting, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, that's the could... lobby. But that can be changed. You don't have to reform the whole country. Okay. Just convince people that uh, carry out the efforts okay. that will 
organize people to change policy. Okay, let me ask you a question very quick, and then we'll go to the phones. Uh, do you think the scenario, what we've seen, what Hezbollah has done to Israel, do you think Hezbollah was, do you think this is real, what we are watching here, that Hezbollah actually was able to, uh, everybody's talking about defeated Israel, even inside Israel itself, or do you think they are basically uh, just pumping up Hezbollah to, uh, to, to show the world that Hezbollah is this uh, big power so we can go in uh, later on with a massive force and people are going to think, well, Hezbollah is so big, so we need a bigger uh, force to take them out. Do you think this was orchestrated? No, I don't. I think it was quite real. Okay. Uh, the uh, overwhelming opinion in Lebanon is probably over 90% now. It, Hezbollah actually, for the first time, an Arab force, namely Hezbollah, uh, held back in defeat, but uh, held back uh, an, uh, an invasion by a very powerful army. The Israeli okay. army is a very powerful very army. Very good. We're going to go to the uh, phones. The Let's go States with uh, line one. Go ahead. very upset by this. Okay. Uh, Tony, go ahead. Uh, here's my question. Very quick. Do you think that there, we're in the midst of the rise of international authoritarianism that will, through international cooperation, um, put down dissent worldwide? Okay, very good. Uh, doctor, did you hear the question? Sorry, but the, the phone calls are not, I'm not hearing the phone calls. Okay. Can you repeat what uh, was Yes, that? his question was, right, what did we do here now? Okay, his question was, uh, do you think we are in the middle of globalization, the new world order, uh, authorized, uh, a national uh, authority here? Is that what we are in the middle of? Well, I mean, it can, you can call it globalization if you want, but it's a, just another phase of uh, old-fashioned imperial policy. I mean, of course, it always you know, changes with different circumstances. Uh, but uh, the United States is a world-dominant power. It's uh, supported by Britain, which is now its junior partner. Uh, other European countries more or less go along. Uh, so it takes, say, Germany, for example. Uh, Germany, which is a powerful state, has just provided Israel with uh, a new class of submarines which can carry nuclear warheads. Well, the point of that uh, is to provide a second strike capacity, meaning if the U.S. and Israel decide to attack Iran uh, and Iran tries to retaliate by striking at Israel, can't strike at the United States, then Israel now has a nuclear option to destroy Iran. So that prevents any... Uh, Iranian deterrent to U.S.-Israeli attack. Well, that's Germany. In fact, Western powers are following their traditional program of trying to ensure that they control the resources and the uh, markets and the populations of most of the world. Okay, so you really think that the war in Iraq was just for oil, that Israel uh, has nothing to do with it? I don't say it has nothing to do with it, but uh, I, I do agree with Iraqis uh, that the major goal of the war was uh, uh, to ensure control over the oil system. In fact, the invasion of Iraq is probably harmful to Israeli interests. Uh, Iraq was never was not a threat to Israel. So, it was, so it this, the this, so what? What Richard Pearl, 1996, wrote the clean break, uh, the strategy for. Uh, uh, securing the realm. Uh, that's not the implementation of that policy that we're seeing here? Uh, there's a good reason why Richard Pearl has been out of the government for years. He's regarded as a crackpot. They didn't follow that policy. He also suggested in that same paper uh, that they should extend a uh, Hashemite kingdom, the Jordanian kingdom, should be extended to Iraq. To Iraq, yeah. I mean, nobody paid the slightest attention. It's crazy. Okay. Tell you what, let's go back to the phones with James from California. Go ahead, James. Hello, uh, thank you, Hashem. Good, sure. good evening to you. Good evening to you, Dr. Chomsky. Um, I had a quick question and comment for Dr. Chomsky. Um, Dr. Chomsky, I've met you uh, a couple of years ago when you'd done a pre presentation in Los Angeles. And I came up to you, and it was, you still never mentioned this fact, but I'd mentioned the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs to you in Jinza. And you know exactly what it was because you and I talked briefly, and you'd mentioned Jim Wolsey, who's part of it. And moments ago, you just mentioned that APAC wasn't a major part of uh, the 
quote unquote Israeli lobby, pro Israel lobby in America. Well, I, I'd like to bring to your attention, sir, the name Morris Amate. Morris Amate is not only a founder with APA, of APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, but also founded Jinza. And we know that the tentacles of the pro Israel lobby go from APAC to Jinza. We know it was behind this war in Iraq with the, in accordance with the clean break agenda. And another aspect I'd like to address with you, because you're basically just the leftist side of the Zionist lobby. You said a lot of good things about what Israel does to the Palestinians to brutally oppress them. But basically, many people in the know, like Jeff Blankfort, an anti-Zionist Jew who's written about you as well, you're just basically the left side of the Zionist lobby. You try to focus on the energy companies as the reason for going into Iraq. And moments ago, you made a comment saying that Israel did a tremendous service for us in the 1967 Six-Day War. I'd like to argue against that, sir. Um, I'll bring up another name. Okay, James, go ahead and... Oh, no, but quickly, uh, this is very important. Uh, yes. A gentleman by the name of Hassam, who was a mentor to Ben Laden, he was displaced off his land when he was living in Janine. No. Uh, ho James, hold on, hold on. Uh, did, you hear the, uh, did you hear what he said, uh, doctor? Yeah, no, I just want to finish quickly. I can hear his voice, but I can't hear what he's saying. Well, I, I think he's having a problem uh, hearing you, Jim, so I'm going to oh, have to... stand by because this is very important. I'd like to also okay. debate against what he said about how Israel... Okay, well, ho ho hold, hold on. Let me, let, me you, okay, let me tell him what you... Okay, let me tell you what you... What he's, uh, what, what, okay, let me tell the doctor what you said. Uh, what James said is that he had met you before, and he apparently discussed some of this, uh, about APAC... Uh, that, that you said that it was not a major part of the uh, uh, of the Israel lobby, and also uh, he said that he had mentioned uh, Morse uh, Amity, who had started Jensa, and he, and he said that you are the left side of the Zionist lobby. Uh, how would you answer that? I would say that it's perfect nonsense. Uh, I'm giving my opinions. If you think they're wrong, tell me why they're wrong. I mean, maybe they are. You know, I'm perfectly open-minded, glad to hear uh, criticism. I'm expressing my interpretation of the facts the best I understand them. Uh, my understanding is uh, pretty much what I described. Sure, APAC is significant, uh, but it's part of. Uh, there's a much stronger lobby, and uh, that's the uh, essentially the articulate intellectual community, which since 1967 uh, has strongly supported. Uh, Israeli expansion and aggression, just as it almost always supports U.S. government policy. And that happens to be U.S. government policy. Okay. Uh, James, very quick. Okay, sure. Um, the second point I'd like to bring up is Dr. Chomsky continually in trying to basically uh, downplay the accuracy of the Mershammer Walt paper on the power and influence of the pro-Israel lobby. He tries to say that Israel did such a service for us in the 1967 Six-Day War. I beg to differ with that. Uh, he said, uh, did, a, did a service for us as far as what? Well, he says that uh, it got rid of secular Arabism. Well, what it did is it basically got hatred against the, the West, particularly America, um, by displacing all the Palestinians off their land in the West Bank, including the mentor of bin Laden, Hassan, who was displaced out of Janine, and it's cost us billions and billions of dollars. In the terror program problem we've had that we'll go leading up to 9/11, and then the World Trade Center attack in 1993, you can read James Benford's okay. text for War Book. Okay. Uh, so he couldn't be more wrong. Okay. Well, Very good. You're, I, I did hear that. Uh, the, the caller is just confused. Is making a logical error. He's confusing two different things. One is the question: What is U.S. government policy? Second is the question: Is that policy to the benefit of the people of the United States? Now, I happen to think that U.S. government policy is quite often not to the benefit of the people of the United States and not intended to be to their benefit, and the same is true of other governments. But that's a separate question from what the policy is. And what the policy is, I think we see quite clearly. Uh, the U.S. government strongly was, uh, was very pleased with Israel's success in destroying their main enemy, secular Arab nationalism, which was regarded as a threat because it threatened to try to use the resources of the region for its own population. And the United States and the West in general uh, wants those resources to be used for its benefit with a rake off to the local tyrant. Well, that's a real conflict. Well, that's why the U.S. has consistently opposed uh, what's called radical nationalism, independent nationalism. 
not just in the Middle East, but everywhere else, in Latin America and Southeast okay. Asia and so on. Well, you can argue that it's not a wise policy, maybe. Uh, but, but, but the question is, does, is, is it the policy, and does it serve the interests of the people who essentially run the country? Well, I think the answer is, is that it does. Actually, let's go back to the lobby. I mean, if the lobby, if, say, APEC, is as important as the caller and others believe, then there's a very simple, tactical conclusion that follows. If APEC is that important, and if it's harming the interests that the government is trying to serve, then what we should do is very simple. We should put on ties and jackets, go to the corporate headquarters of uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, Intel, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan, and so on, and just patiently explain to them that their interests are being harmed by a lobby that they can wipe out in five minutes in terms of political power and economic okay. wealth. Uh, and doctor, so we only have a few minutes why left. Why do that? We only have a few minutes left. I want to try to get some more callers on. Sarah, go ahead. Hello, um, Dr. Talawi. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Chomsky. Yes. Um, what does he think about the repercussions of the Lebanon war on the Palestinian issue? Does he think the Israelis may have lost a sense of security by the loss of sense of invincibility and security? Or would Israel try to efface its loss by becoming more intransigent in regards to compromising occupation? Okay, thank you. I'll listen in. Thanks. Same problem. I'm afraid I couldn't hear the words. Okay. Can you repeat? She was saying, uh, what do you think the repercussions going to be now uh, for the Palestinians that Israel was defeated in Lebanon? Do you think now we're going to see more of an aggressive uh, Israel? Yeah, I think so. And remember, at least in my view, it is not Israel. I agree with the Lebanese and others that it's the U.S.-Israel, the U.S.-Israeli alliance. Uh, right now, the United States and Israel are... Um, extend what I said, are carrying out a program, it's not just words, they're implementing a program to annex to Israel okay. valuable land and the major resources in the water of the West Bank to break the rest of it up into unviable enclaves, cantons, se virtually separated from one another and uh, also from whatever little piece of Jerusalem will be left to the Palestinians. So the shrinking Palestinian lands will be broken up by infrastructure projects, uh, uh, other uh, settlement, uh, the separation wall, and so on. Okay. Uh, it, uh, and the whole, uh, what's left, will be imprisoned because Jordan, uh, Israel will be taken over the Jordan Valley. Okay. Uh, those are the programs that you and I are paying for right now and that Israel is implementing with the backing of the Bush administration. So, yeah, and I think those programs will intensify unless we do something okay. about it. And okay. we can do something about it. It's not out of our hand. All right. Uh, doctor, we're going to be going very quickly. Uh, Dale, go ahead, Dale, very quick, 30 seconds. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> ask you, everybody's always talking about the oil. Um, what does India have to do with the oil? Because I think they have the largest refineries, and all of the Arab countries have to send their oil to India. So what does India have to do with oil? Okay, this? thank you. Uh, what does India have to do with oil? India? What does India have to do with oil? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, uh, she what said, what does India have to do with oil? India? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 she said something about India. India has the largest refineries. I'm really, no, not no, really India sure. India doesn't have the largest refineries. India is an oil importer. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what. Let's go, let's go to AJ on line one. Go ahead, AJ. AJ, you're on. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Chomsky. Yes, very quick. Uh, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chomsky, I read your book when I was in college in, in North Africa. It's called Gerns of Grammar. And that was my first introduction to your work. My question to you is this. I'm an Arab American, and I really do feel for the Palestinians there. I'm a blood, my family. But there's lack of democracy in the Arab world, and there's lack of human rights. 
I mean, how can we proceed by changing the lives of those people who are oppressed by their government and by the United States? Okay. Policy? Uh, very good. Uh, very good. Uh, we, we're out of time. Uh, doctor, go ahead. Uh, 30 seconds. Could, could you repeat the question? Uh, he said something about uh, the lack of democracy in, in the Middle East. How, how can we improve uh, uh, the lives of the people there? We're, we're, we're like 30 seconds. How can we overcome this democracy thing? Well, we can help democracy develop by stop by putting an end to our prevention okay. of democracy. The U.S. Uh, has been intervening for years to prevent democracy. Okay. They can Do Dr. Chomsky, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I should not even have taken that call because we are completely out of time. Uh, I need probably 10 hours with you just to uh, scratch the surface. Sir, I only have uh, time to say thank you for coming on the program. Very, very pleased to be with you. Thank you. Back in five minutes.